Hello. How do our energy models and our evolving energy models help answer our unanswered questions? What is the price of energy? What's the demand? What's the supply mix? How is climate change going to affect uh, energy demand and uh, changing supply? Where to invest and how much money will we make? This is the research that um, Muhammad Alvinar and I have been doing over the past couple of years, and particularly looking at the use of agent-based models to help um, understand and answer these questions. What I will do here is walk through the models that we have used over the past 50 years and then focus on the agent-based models. So first, let's just kind of remember what Drucker reminded us, that forecasting and modeling is not respectable, and in fact, that we're going to be wrong and that this is particularly true in energy. So whether we're looking at how much oil the OPEC countries will produce and whether they'll abide by the quotas or not, or what the demand for oil and gas is gonna be in various parts of the country and world it is very hard to forecast. So that's why I have the Jackson Pollock picture here. This looks like a chaotic picture, but underneath, he was pointing, he was painting a picture of the reality that evolved from his figurative view of the world. In computer science, we have kind of tried to take this idea of complexity and complicated worlds and model it in using the more sophisticated tools that we have got in terms of machine learning and behavioral economics. And so this is what we were gonna be looking at as we look at our models. Of course, and Merton reminded us, that there are always unintended consequences to our actions that are very hard to model. So here is the boom and bust situation that we have in energy prices. And if we look at the past 150 years, we have the early period when oil was discovered in Pennsylvania and then Texas and the boom and bust that happened so that when it, prices were high, you made a lot of money, when it was low, you lost money and you went bankrupt. And of course, uh, J.D. Rockefeller and Standard Oil worked hard to kind of control the volatility of that market, which, as, you, as we all know, was uh, gave um, birth to the antitrust laws in the United States. But nonetheless, there is that situation where you have the boom and bust. Then there's this period, really from the 1920s to 1970, where there's relative stability, some ups and downs, but somewhat manageable. And so this is the Texas Railroad Commission. This is the role of Seven Sisters in controlling supply. And then, of course, we hit the 1970s and the rise of OPEC. And so we've been in, in another period of incredible volatility, which makes investing in energy very difficult and trying to figure out our futures, not simple at all. And here, of course, are the models that we're all familiar with regarding energy. And again, the point is that we cannot forecast what's gonna happen in the future. We miss by a lot. The IEA has been missing demand by 20, 30%. And, and looking forward, we don't know how quickly um, electric vehicles are going to be adopted and how that's going to uh, change energy demand. Therefore, if you don't know what demand is, you have we have no idea really what price is. And again, what we see here on the right-hand side is the predictions of price. And we all do this and we're trying to figure it out. What do you see is upward sloping lines and not the volatility of energy because there's the imbalances in the energy market. So that's the real challenge that we have. Don't know what the demand is, we don't know what price is, therefore it really makes investing quite difficult. Um, so why have we had this price volatility? So just focusing on the past 50, 60 years, we have this period of stagflation, then we get new fields coming in, then we get the growth in Asia, we had the financial crisis, and then we've been in this period of, of sanctions lately towards our Russia and Iran. All these political tensions affect supply and demand. Then new technology comes in that you can go, you can you know explore uh, the deep sea uh, oil fields in the North Sea, or you could go up to Alaska and bring the oil down from Alaska. Or as you know later on, the technology of um, hydraulic um, um, drilling has allowed opened up the whole shale fields in the United States. So those are some of the, the things that have kind of fed into this. Uh, volatility. And of course, there are different roles of different market players in sort of how much influence they have in it. And this is 
what I've tried to show here is that this is a shifting dynamic and not easy to model in there. And we've had different models that have evolved out of this. So in a more, in here's the, in the past 50 years, 50, 60 years, I'm gonna talk about some of the models with the focus on the heterogeneity and the agent-based models that um, we're, we're looking at. First, of course, going back to the 50s, we're basically looking at how much oil is out there, what is the size of the fields, how much production will come out of those fields, and that is sort of the whole resource economics that evolved and the concept of peak oil because there would be only a certain amount of oil coming out of a field. And that was the real sense of, gee, we could possibly be running out of oil. But of course, we didn't know what technology, how technology would change. We didn't know how many more other, other fields would come in to play once price, prices move. Then within that, you've got different market players with different influence that can affect um, where they go in terms of exploration and development and how they control or don't control the markets. This is, of course, the Seven Sisters, which are, had a heavy investment in the Middle East after they you know, expanded from um, the developed world and then the growth of market of OPEC and the changing oligopolistic structure of the market. Here, of course, the players matter and how they operate matters. OPEC and really changed the whole dynamic of modeling and then we get the partial equilibrium model thing that, that came out of shell and systems dynamics and really trying to figure out from a data standpoint what is the demand and supply in each different region of the world um, and that's been a huge effort and and it's, and it's from this the scenarios have evolved var basically is a kind of stepping back from these big macro data uh, models and said hey complicated you know, market and energy world that we're dealing in. Let's just look at price as sort of whether you have market clearing or not and try to understand why there's price volatility and the supply demand imbalances or surprises and to what extent those are endogenous or exogenous surprises. And so that has been the emphasis of a lot of models since then is let's not go into all this complex partial equilibrium, let's just try to understand the nature of market clearing or not and the volatility of prices. And finally, what we're looking at here is the role of different agents, if you want to say oligopolistic players, and their different behavioral tactic, um, behavioral variables, and uh, in terms of what guides their investment and production, and how they might be different, and how that affects market. So this is the, comes out of computational economics and then advanced machine learning, and kind of a way of kind of looking at and modeling behavior. So this is a very simplistic way of kind of saying that there are different models looking at different points in time trying to answer different questions. Um, we all know peak oil and the supply curves and the early idea that there was a limit to how much oil and gas can come out of a field based basically on geology and the economics of the field. So you discover a field, then you develop it, and then the decline rates and the field may last five, 10, 20 years with shale, it's less. But nonetheless, this idea was that there is a limit to the amount of oil and gas that's out there. What we of course know is that this is, that we didn't really think about all the other fields in the world and that they could be exploited and that we didn't understand the nature of technology and how that could really change the amount of oil and gas that we get out of a field. Oligopolistic, competition, basically, depending where you were, you have a different cost curve. And of course, what we have here is the cost curve on the left of the Middle East, which has a huge amount of oil and gas and very low cost, and they're very big players. And then you've got the larger fields that would be offshore, such as the North Sea, but are higher cost. And each one of these fields is a different, in regions, is a different set of players and different sort of behavior of how they operate and invest. And as you'll see on the right, we can see the, the shifting market share and role of each one of these players, whether it be the US, Russia, Venezuela, which has been a steady supplier, Saudi Arabia, Iraq. And then of course, in the past 10 years, shale oil coming on. Again, understanding the nature of these players and how they 
operate and affect the market is important. And this is sort of what Edelman has developed and coming out of MIT. Um, the 1970s ushered in these huge macro partial equilibrium models, um, IEA in, in Paris, and then we've got Shell, and then we've got all the oil companies gathering all this data, trying to understand the nature of demand in each region, whether their pipelines bringing the gas and oil, whether there's sh big ships coming in. And so the whole supply chain of providing the various energy sources to, to whatever part of the economy. And then what's the growth of the economy and to what extent is economic growth and use of energy tied in. So here we have nice big regression models. I'm looking at it and trying to sort of um, get some understanding of the relative efficiency of each area of each part of the economy and how it might change in terms of energy use. And then you get a model saying here is the demand for energy and here's the various supply and of course prices. Naturally what's come in here is of course the externality of CO2 emissions and um, global climate change. So where we are out of this is that going back to Drucker is kind of generating scenarios based on certain assumptions of technology of relative energy efficiency of elasticity we say here is going to be the relative you know supply of oil and gas going forward and you can see on the top chart here you've got a declining level of the fossil fuels although there's still some demand for it particularly oil and gas and declining coal and a rising level of of um, sus sustainable greener energies and where that demand comes from is of course Asia and emerging countries. And so that becomes the, the scenario and we can run various different scenarios with different assumptions, trying to figure out what's gonna happen over the next 10 or 20 years and therefore what investments you should be having. So that's a lot of detail, a lot of information, big reports that we all have to spend time digging into. Some people just say, let's step back, become much more simple. There's a market price of oil and gas. What is that? And it varies and changes because of supply and demand imbalances. And sometimes there's surprises, sometimes there's a recession, sometimes there's a hurricane, which will change the demand for energy, or other times there'll be new fields coming in, or a war and everything else. So we're trying to figure out, this is Killian and Hamilton, in a more macro sense, let's look at the volatility of prices, and what changes the imbalances in the market and to what extent they can be rebalanced in the case largely by Saudi Arabia and Iraq so that there is some level of equilibrium and less volatility in prices. And if there's less volatility in prices, then individual um, companies and countries can figure out what their investments are. And so there's been a lot of work over the past 20 years and sort of the, the VAR models and trying to understand to what extent there's endogenous surprises or exogenous surprises and how those happen. So that's kind of the history of the models that have evolved in a very simplistic way over the past 40 years. What we're doing here is basically saying, yeah, let's take all that information and then use basic com um, computational economics and uh, the idea that there are different producers with different behaviors. So you've got the Middle East countries with low cost national oil companies, a, a governance structure, which is very much oriented towards the development of the country, setting different objectives and less um, influenced by the day-to-day -day movements in the market. Then of course you have our non-OPEC uh, Western producers. They're mature, they're using, uh, they're, they're uh, operating in different fields. They generally have higher costs. They're very cognizant of market movements. Um, they're competitive and they're kind of operating in well, how does the market value the stock? Do they have the money to develop new fields? And so that's another group of uh, producers. Russia and CIS is a whole different set, largely oil and gas located far away from markets. So they have to get the gas and oil to the markets, whether it be in Asia or Europe. And they try to lock in contracts that makes it, that makes it work. And, they need a joint venture projects to help develop them. So sanctions very much affects them, but they're a large producer. And of course we have these huge offshore oil fields, which we have been just discovering over the past 30, 40 years, tremendous amount of technology and investment to make them happen, whether it's in the North Sea 
or Brazil. And again, that's a big flow of oil and gas coming into the market. U.S. shale has been is very different than these traditional oil and gas, as we all know, being relatively short term, um, not that costly to develop, and they don't last that long. So you can bring you can bring the rigs in quickly, develop it in two or three years, and get out and making your money. So that has those are and what I'm trying to show here is that these agents operate differently and have different behavioral characteristics. And that's what we're trying to understand, how that changes the dynamics of the market and makes it more or less volatile and may or may not change the mix of energy. So again, uh, we know the forecast of oil demand is varies quite a lot. And as you can see, it could be up from 120 million down to 70 million. That's a 50 million barrel per day variance based on, on different assumptions. And then the dotted line shows the decline in the existing oil fields, the telling sort of principle that there is a decline rate and that we're gonna to have to invest and develop, but how and where do you do that? And so that's the challenge we have in terms of investing and figuring out how we supply the market. What I want to show here is the fact that our agents, and I'm just showing three of them, are different and their capital spending is quite different and their productivity is quite different. On the left here, you see the capital spending is quite different. The orange line shows the um, Middle Eastern countries, you know, relatively low, couple spikes when they develop new fields, whereas uh, you, Europe and uh, CIS and uh, North America, higher and more volatile. Productivity wise, of course, larger fields, low cost, the Middle East has the highest productivity in terms of capital to production. And the US, you see, has had these declining fields of low productivity until shale comes in into around 2008 and 9. And then that, and they got a big drop in their productivity. And that's why they're coming into the market. Okay, stepping back. And this is what we're modeling and trying to show and saying each one of these agents, regional agents with different costs and different market structure, is decides differently. And so this creates a dynamic market and nonlinear sets of relationships. This is a probabilistic investment decision. And therefore, if you don't know what you're going to invest, then you don't know what the future production is. So you may invest. This is how we're writing this. May invest if the price is high. Now that's, we don't know exactly what that means. For the Middle East, a price high of 50, 60 might be a price high for a shale and maybe 70 or 80. So it matters a great deal what that what that means. And then they're looking at the supply and demand condition when the market is it oversupplied or undersupplied, which is an anticipation of price. And obviously their own characteristics of the fields that develop. So the idea is it's a probability of investing based on a whole bunch of variables. We're gonna simplify it to a couple and they're, they're also looking at their costs. What that means is that we get cyclical boom and bust heterogeneous investment decisions, which means that production also is that way. So it's very hard to smooth production and have supply equal demand. So this is naturally, we have a market that's oversupplied or undersupplied. And so that's what we're doing. Here is kind of an illustration of this as showing the decision time between the discovery and development of fields. And what you'll see is the OPEC on the left here has stretches it out. Yes, with they develop a certain amount of their fields within five years, but then they can stretch out and wait 20 years. That's not the case in the non-OPEP. Most of the fields are discovered and developed relatively quickly. They basically discover it, get the financing, and go ahead and do it based on their expectations. So again, what we've got here is just illustrating the fact that there are tremendous differences across the world and that there are lots of um, differences in break-even costs here that are, we're showing in different, different parts of the world, and that there is a discretionary choice on investment. The red in these graphs shows the amount of investment. What you'll see, like if you look at the Middle East, we've got a lot of fields with low break-evens, but they're not investing in all of them. Whereas the CIS seems to be investing in most of their low break-even fields. And so each part of the world has a decision-making decision process of what they invest in and develop. And again, same thing that we're showing. The red is indicating investment in positive net present value. What they see is positive net present value projects. Again, look at the Middle East. Lots of positive net present value 
um, fields and projects they haven't invested. CIS, a lot of investment. Latin America, each one is different. And so this is, again, why we've got such a, a dynamic market in terms of supply, because each of these different agents decides differently on when to invest and produce. So here is just a computational graph of this decision process based upon uh, moving average of prices, current prices, which is the x-axis. So basically we're trying to say if their prices are high, how are they gonna respond? If it's supply demand balance, do they see tight markets or loose markets, which is the z-axis coming out towards us, and the investment, which is the y-axis. So what we're showing here is on the yellow side, when prices are high, almost all investment goes forward. But with lower prices, undersupplied markets, the green part, in other words, are tight, they, they, um, they, they invest, but low oversupplied so that they, you know, there's too much oil coming in there, there's non-investment. So this is just kind of illustrating the nature of these decisions in different parts of the world and how that affects investment decision. What this leads to, is a very complicated map in terms of investment. So simply speaking, and if you look here in terms of reserves, oil and gas reserves are largely in the Middle East and they're relatively low cost. And they're you know obviously close to Asian and European markets. They do not have to invest as much. Other parts of the world, and which is the IOCs, do not have as much reserves, have to invest more and they have to you know, bring it to the markets in Asia and Europe because that's not where they're located. And of course, all this is based upon what they think the future prices are gonna be, which we know is dependent upon the investment and production behavior. So this is basically a way of showing the dynamics of the market and how that can affect the amount of supply that comes on and also the changing energy mix. Okay. That's a lot of information that we've looked at and kind of modeling. The more simple one that we finance people kind of say is, hey, make some assumptions about the world, figure out what is happening in individual companies. Or do they have good fields? What's their cost of production? Do they have good workers and that can get to the fields and can they supply the market? And then you do a whole bunch of net present value um, calculations, simple ones, saying positive cash flow. And then we say, this is a good investment or not a good investment. And these are companies will get money or not get money. So that's the, the micro macro of what, what we do we teach in finance. And that of course ties to the amount of rigs that are out there. And when there's a lot of regularization, there's a lot of investment, which means there's gonna be future production and that ties to prices. And we can see when prices were you know, over, um, over 100 bucks a barrel, there's a lot of rig activity, and then that's you know, within a year or two, there's a lot of production, which means that the prices go down, and that's the boom bust in terms of the markets. And we, of course, this happened in uh, the shale, and you can see the cycle of shale production and development when prices were high, a lot of oil and gas, and they crashed when the Saudis increased production, and then the rig activity dropped, and now we're having a similar situation. So that's sort of a quick history of the modeling and different approaches that we've used models for to try to understand our markets. And essentially, we need all these tools to understand the dynamics of the market and then find simple ways to say, oh, okay, essentially, and this is the argument we're putting here, is that these agents operate and behave differently and invest differently and therefore the understanding and modeling how these agents invest in will affect the amount of supply and the, and, the, and the eventual price of the oil and gas. So that's what we're trying to do here. And uh, we think this is a tremendous advance to where we were 40, 50 years ago. Of course, going back to the pictures that I showed you at the beginning, the complex world of Pollock is really complex. We can't understand it. Whereas underneath, and this is what anger and which is what we all try to do to kind of come down to simple statements and draw clean lines and say, oh gee, invest when prices are, if your costs are low and prices look like they're gonna be high and then, and then or 
don't invest it because you feel that there's going to be a big shift to uh, like electric vehicles in certain parts of the world. So that is essentially what we're trying to do is find ways to understand and unravel the complexity of the market and show the dynamics of it so that we can chart the future. And this is not easy. It's always challenging and terribly exciting. Thank you very much.